With all the information out there about HIV, the campaigns, the resources, even the debate, we think we know a lot about it. But disinformation, cliches and stigma still remain, and those living with HIV continue to suffer behind closed doors. I'm about to meet Pindile Setole Spong, a 27-year-old living openly with HIV. She's decided to share her life journey as an act of service to help change attitudes towards the virus, to challenge and to connect, to help us step out from locked-in perceptions and confront HIV as it truly is today. HIV can't be looked at on its own, so it's not just about the technical side of HIV or just taking ARVs or just having protected sex. Hi, Lisa, how are you? <laughs> nice to find you. Nice to find you too. Do you want to grab some coffee? I'd love to. Nice to find you here with your helmet. Yeah, you came on your bike. My biggest area of, of concern, the area that interests me most now, is like lifestyle, you know, how you eat, how you have relationships, because I've seen in my personal life even that when I'm happiest, um, my CD4 count goes up. Safety first. So you haven't got a second helmet, so I can come zooming with you. This year I've been sick, I've been getting the flu a lot, and um, and then I went to go do my, my regular bloods with my doctor, so checking my CD4 count and my viral load and stuff. And I was so, I was so panicked because I was like, oh, I'm sure it's gone down. I'm sure like maybe the virus is like everywhere and it's attacking or that's why I've been so sick. And then he was like, no, like he's like, it happens to everyone. <laughs> like you're not special. I think that there's this like preconception or misconception that like because you're HIV positive, like everything is related to it. Sometimes it's just like the way the human body functions. I think in a world where you treat it like you're different because of your status. It's good to have people like my doctor who are like, it's, it's, yes, you're HIV positive, but like it's not really gonna change much of your life that dramas dramatically or drastically. This is my ARVs, Trivans. I take these at night. Um, I started another regimen when I was first diagnosed and that didn't really work for me. I was taking about eight pills twice a day. This one, on the other hand, I just like pop one of these bad boys and it's got like everything I need in it. It's kept me alive, so <laughs> I guess it's doing its job. The other day I was going through my, my old report cards from when I was in kindergarten. I was the loud, naughty one in the class. I would always just make jokes and try to make people laugh and, and I was just the clown. And I also had a very strong personality from a very early age, it seemed. And I kind of would go about doing things my own way. My mom was a domestic worker um, and my dad, although he wasn't in the picture, he was a truck driver for uh, Clover. And I had two older sisters, so Zanele and Linky, and I was the baby of the family. Mm, your hair looks so good. How are you? Your legs look better than mine. I know, I'm working out. <laughs> what do you do? With, like, do you take classes though or something? I run. Pindi is How long do you run, though? crazy. She's awkward sometimes. <laughs> and she's funny in uh, her own little way. <laughs> we need to learn the rest of this actually. Yeah. We go to a mall and she greets everybody, she ch chats with everybody and it makes me uncomfortable. So yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's Pindi for you. Like, you know, one time my cousin had Pindi with school shoes. She took my uncle's boots, she put them on, she started walking to school. No. Mm -mm. I'm just looking. Yeah. <laughs> your looking means it's going in, into your bag. I, I just am bought just it. Looking. Give it. <sighs> that means I'm never gonna see it again. Uh no. Uh no. Avert your eyes. Uh, no, that's my birthday dress. From the time I was born to about four years old, I was living in Pretoria with my sisters and my grandmother and my aunts and my uncles and my cousins, living in my grandmother's house in Pretoria. And then when I was about four years old, I got sick at the time and my mom moved me to live with her in Johannesburg. 
I didn't know the exact causes or the exact illnesses that I had. I just remember moving with my mom to Joburg and getting to a new environment, which was completely different from rural Pretoria because it was now the city. We were living in a suburb. What was it like being with your mom? My mom and I, and I had a very close relationship because I think it, there was just the two of us, so we could only lean on each other. And my mom was very honest with me and open with me in a way that I don't think would have been possible if we lived in the normal family structure of like grandparents and all the kids and all the cousins and, and all the uncles and stuff. So that was great. So Z, we're cooking today. Prawn pasta. You like prawns, don't you? I thought you did. I wanted to make this recipe specifically for you, and then now you're saying they're weird. One cook. of the things my mom and I would do together was we would lot. cook. But who are you going to say? Um, well, <laughs> she would cook and I would be eating and just watching her cook. She had this passion for Italian cooking. I don't know where it came from, but she really loved making like lasagnas and like homemade tomato sauces. And like, she made probably the best lasagna I've ever tasted in my life. And so that kind of was how our relationship formed was around her cooking dinner for the family she worked for and me eating and kind of picking the food and watching her and I guess learning because now in retrospect, I, I think I'm a good cook because of what I watched her do and, and my passion for cooking stems from that interaction. And I started to associate cooking and eating with this kind of communal family feel. And it's very important for me now to, to always have that. One day, like I really didn't know her, you know, when she lived in Joe, it was like, I preferred my cousin to Pindi. So it was kind of awkward sometimes, you know, and I think maybe it's just a little bit of jealousy, you know, because she goes to do all the cool stuff with mom and whatever, and I felt like, oh, I'm stuck in Pretoria, and, you know, and it's like, why her than me? But, you know, she's my little sister, so it was okay. We don't really talk about mom. There's not much to say, really. At least you had time with her. I try to come up with memories and there's nothing. Yeah. Nothing whatsoever, so. My mom's name is Polina Satole. From an early age, I knew she was special just because of the way people reacted to her. People were really respectful of her. Even in a domestic worker uniform, she just had an air about her that was refined and very like elegant and like just amazing and beautiful. Because my dad wasn't really in the picture, she was raising my sisters and I as a single parent. And she was also helping some of my aunts who didn't have work and my uncles who didn't have work and their kids, etc. And she was always the person who, even though she was the youngest in the family um, of her seven siblings, she was the person that, you know, my aunts and uncles would always go to for like help and advice. And she was kind of the breadwinner, she was the confidant, she was the teacher, um, and even some of my cousins called her mom because she was also more there um, as much as she could for, for all of us emotionally. My mom got sick, um, and when she got sick, we had to, I remember we had to go to live with my aunt in KZN. I think it was for that period of time while she was sick, and... <sighs> wow. Um, I remember the day they, I think they called to say she had passed on, and... Man. I remember seeing her in her coffin, and she, she looked really healthy. She was mom. Um, and uh, I, I don't think it really sunk in that this was it. This was the last time I'd actually physically be seeing her. Um, and so, yeah, it was only later on in life that I realized that actually, you know, she was gone um, and there was nothing I could do about it. I remember my older sister telling me that I'd been sick when I was a child when I was born. 
Nothing really connected for me. It was just like, oh, I was just a sickly child. When Pindi lost her mother suddenly at the age of eight, her and her sister's future lay in the hands of their relatives. It was decided then that my older sister would stay with my aunt in, in Joburg, and that my middle sister, Zanela, and I would move to, to KZN to go live my, with my aunt um, and her husband and her kids. an option you can't choose if you want to stay in Pretoria or you want to live wherever if my aunt says we're going we're going like you can't tell her anything so we went to Durban we got there we hated it we weren't given as much love or attention and especially for me um, having grown up with my mom, having been given the opportunity to get to know her and, and spend time with her and know what like a parent's love looks like and feels like, to being the extra mouth that you have to feed, it became difficult to come to terms with my new reality. Everyone else, like our cousins, was so used to it that they'd be like, oh, why are you crying, why are you upset? We weren't used to that type of violence and that type of discipline. How did you and Zanella get through those times? We became each other's therapists and each other's survival tools in a lot of ways. We would sit outside and we would stay out there for hours and just cry, wanting something other than what we had. Wanting to, to just, yeah, just not be there anymore, just to, yeah, just to disappear and, and go back to our former life, go back to, to what was better and what we had known before. When I had uh, just moved to Johannesburg, I was introduced to a book, The Water Babies, that my mom would read to me. It was about this young boy who was a chimney sweeper and who was abused. He falls into this water world where young, abandoned children are happy, and it's like this magical, beautiful place where they have control of their lives. In many ways, that book influenced the way I, I saw life, and, and especially that period in, in Natal, was wanting to be a water baby myself and find a way to escape uh, the realities of the environment that we had just been thrust into. There was a woman who was living next door to the house where my mom worked, and her name was Desiree Spong. I guess her and my mom had become friends before I moved to Joburg with my mom. And so when I moved there at four years old, Desiree would, would take me in and I'd be allowed to go and play at her house and watch movies and stuff. So during the time that we were living in Natal, um, Desiree, because she was she was a friend of my mom's and she had known me since I was four, she would invite us to come and visit her during school holidays, to come stay with her in Joburg. And then at some point, I was about 12 or 13, we were driving on Jan Smuts. My sister and I were speaking in, in Zulu and we were deciding whether or not to tell her. And I, I kept saying, like, we just have to tell her that we can't live like this. We keep saying we're gonna leave, but we haven't, you know, we don't have the money to leave Natal. We don't have the money to run away. Where are we gonna run away to? So we should just tell her that, you know, what's happening, that there's abuse, that there's violence, that it's not a great place to live. Um, and so we just kind of told her, we're like, by the way, this is what's happening in Natal. How did Desiree react? She was shocked. I think she was also upset because we hadn't told her earlier. And I also think she was a bit confused and lost on what to do. Because, I mean, what do you do when two kids tell you that they're being abused? Um, she was a single woman living in Joburg. Um, she was an art dealer. She, she had enough money to kind of take care of herself and, yes, fly us in and, and host parties, but it wasn't... I don't think adoption was even in her mind. Zanele's loyalty was torn when she had to make the tough decision to either start a new life with Pindi and Desiree or remain in KZN. Overwhelmed, she decided to stay. 
I think in her taking action, it actually divided the family. And then we had to go through the whole process of social workers and whatever. And that's how I think, yeah, and that's how Pindi got adopted, yeah. So, yeah, it is dramatic. <laughs> You took a leap. Yeah, I told the truth, and then life was was different. It, it changed. I had to obviously go back to KZN, so we never really had contact. You know, I don't have a cell phone. We didn't have a phone at home, so we didn't really have anything. So I never heard from Pindi ever since. Biggest trauma for me in that entire situation um, that that became apparent as soon as I was adopted was that I started to mistrust a lot of adults or um, adult figures in my life because of what had happened. So it took a while for me to kind of come to terms with, okay, this is someone who really does care about me, who does love me, who does want the best for me. It took me a very long time to kind of open up and to trust Desiree's intentions. But once I got used to it, we formed a really strong bond. She was learning to be a mother and I was learning to be a teenage daughter. We became really reliant on each other and in fact we were very, we were basically best friends for the longest of times. I went to Kingsmead, which is a private girls school in Johannesburg. It wasn't so much a culture shock as it was just a, a class shock. Firstly, I'd never seen wealth like that ever before in my life. Um, kids had personal drivers and, you know, um, they were kids of like some of the richest people in South Africa that I went to school with. Yeah. <laughs> She's just one of those yeah. people that everyone sort of, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. There it is. Kruger House. To Pendile's tallest bunk. 2007. Kruger House captain. <laughs> the whole school had to vote for you. And I won by such like, a very large margin or something, which kind of threw me off. I knew that I was in the running, but I thought, oh no, I'll maybe be deputy or something. But then I became Kruger House Captain, and that was pretty cool. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know where this comes from? No. You gave it to me. Really? Grade 11. I have great taste. <laughs> <laughs> you really do. <laughs> She was my English teacher. She became one of my biggest support systems during my high school career and even now. We're still great friends. You like my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't have to pay you. I just need to drink you with you and bring you one. <laughs> play some uh, and I'm like, okay. And she was also the person who introduced me to writing. It became an outlet for me to kind of express whatever I was feeling or whatever emotions I was going through and, and insecurities, etc. I do remember her struggling with fitting in. Um, she was a black girl adopted by a white family in an exclusive school. She wasn't like all the rest of the girls there. And she had to try and fit in, which she did amazingly. Not only fit in, but she got recognized and noticed and admired by her peers, which I think was quite amazing considering the behind the scenes battles that she was experiencing. It was hard to adjust to the new environment and the new levels of expectation. Little things that we weren't taught in Mpangin. We hadn't even been taught our times tables by the time of 10, you know, which is something, it's the basis of mathematics. And so I had to kind of play catch up a lot. 
and then having to almost relearn English again and certain social norms like looking person in the eye and and um, how to interact with a different group of people um, who are in a different social class to you and um, so that was weird for me. Pindi was a domestic worker's child, but she wasn't being brought up like a domestic worker's child. So she had to figure out where she fits it in and how she fits it in. Just thinking about the, the protests that are happening in schools now, it's getting us discussing this cultural difference and the, the way that in, in schools like ours, there is a whiteness that is expected of all students and a subtle intolerance of other races, cultures, um, sets. And I think the sooner we start to have these discussions, the better off we'll all be. I think that somebody like Pindi would have been at the forefront of these discussions when she was at school, because that is just the kind of kid she was. She wouldn't be shy to stand up with her natural hair and, and say, look, here I am. When I finished school, I decided to take a gap year. I didn't know what I wanted to study, so I thought a gap year would be the best way to try to figure out what my next move would be. During that year, I worked at a little secondhand bookshop in Parkview. While I was working at the bookshop, I met the first love of my life, Graham. Around the end of August of that year, um, so I'd been seeing Graham for, for a few months now, I'd had my first sexual experience, um, I started getting really, really sick. I had like a really bad fever and it just wouldn't go down, the temperature wouldn't go down, and I had like really bad thrush in my mouth and, um, and at some point one of um, Desiree's friends, who was a nurse, suggested that we go and see a doctor and get some bloods done. What did the doctor say to you? I remember she called one day when I was at the bookshop and she just said, oh yeah, your white blood cell count is really, really low. Um, so I'd like to do some other tests. You know, she still hadn't figured out why. She did the HIV test and then on the 1st of September, I always remember it was spring day, um, she called us in and she was like, yeah, you both need to come in. And then I was diagnosed and my doctor, she, she kind of looked at us both and she said, well, um, you have a CD for count of two and um, your viral load is off the charts, so you need to go into hospital. Um, I think, I don't actually know what happened afterwards. I kind of blanked out. I just, I remember her my mom talking and I was kind of like, what, HIV? And thinking also that I'd read this book that I just finished the day before, literally the day before, um, about HIV and, and kind of like, okay, so what now? And thinking I was gonna die because in the book, the young man dies. And I went into hospital for about two, three months. It was all a big blur. I had like one illness after the other. I had every procedure under the sun. They thought I had malaria, I had lumbar punctures, I had different doctors coming in at different times saying, okay, we need to do this. The experience wasn't as traumatic as it might have been for me because I was on morphine most of the time. So I was actually quite high, like having like these like hallucinations of a mixture between like the water babies and then this guy who dies in the book that I'd read before. I was put on a course of ARVs and slowly but surely I started getting better and I was uh, released from hospital. We started wondering like where it had come from. My first instinct was to think maybe I'd gotten it from my boyfriend, even though actually I'd used protection with him. So he got tested, my boyfriend Graham got tested and his results came back negative. And it took a, about a year or two for us to start to kind of pinpoint the origins of the virus. We discovered that my mom had died from AIDS-related illnesses. From then on, we found out that actually, I probably was born with it. Mm -hmm. 
once we had figured out where I got it from, everything also started to fall into place. Why I was always sick as a child. It was a thread that tied my life story together in a weird way. The big shock for me was realizing what my mom had died of, and then the harsh realities of, of when I started realizing and learning about HIV, of what a horrible kind of death it, it would have been for her. And so um, thinking back on her experience and what she went through, and so that was more traumatic to me than realizing that I had gotten it from birth. Having recently been diagnosed with HIV, Pindi was determined to live a normal life. She'd always wanted to study dance at the University of Cape Town, but a sudden bout of pneumonia forced her to pursue a course in humanities instead. University, that's when everyone's sexual exploration happens. But for me, it was kind of delayed. I wasn't comfortable with dating. I was still, you know, learning and figuring out what it meant to be HIV positive, etc. We were walking up the stairs to go catch the bus, um, one of the UST buses, and um, my friend Cizwe started talking about uh, wanting to do something around HIV awareness at UCT. At the time, he didn't know about my status because I hadn't really told anyone. I just suggested that I talk about it. And he kind of looked at me and was like, oh, why? What do you know about HIV? And I was like, well, yeah, I'm HIV positive. Um, and I think he was a bit shocked, uh, firstly because of the manner in which I just kind of blurted it out. Um, but I also think he, he wasn't sure if I, was, if I knew what I was doing, which of course I didn't. We came up with this idea of having a talk, uh, one lunch break. We both felt that students at the university didn't know much about HIV and felt exempt because of their sense of privilege of being educated, of being at university, that, you know, HIV would never happen to them. The night before, I tried to prepare for it, thinking about, like, how do you communicate this thing that no one really knows about, at least from a lived experience perspective. To the day of the talk, um, a friend of mine and I were kind of walking around campus and asking people if they're going to come for the talk and, and not knowing that I was <laughs> the person who was going to give the talk. Um, one, one particular group kind of looked at us and was like, no, we don't want to hear some story about some girl who's dying of HIV. And um, I was like, well, actually, I'm, I'm the person who's going to be speaking, and I'm not dying of HIV. I'm actually very healthy, thank you very much. But uh, you should come listen so you actually learn about HIV. And in the end, I didn't end up writing anything at all. I just kind of went up on stage and fumbled my way through it, and I was like, hi, everyone. My name is Pindi, and I'm HIV positive. I think for, for myself and, and certainly for, for some of the people there, it was a very healing experience in that we, we got to say out loud the thing that scared us most. Yes, there were people who still who stigmatized me or who wouldn't talk to me or who looked at me and kind of pointed and, you know, would say things in hushed tones, but I felt good because I felt like I didn't have to hide anything anymore. It was kind of all out in the open and was very liberating for me to kind of just not have to hide anymore. It was, it was such a relief. <laughs> Towards the end of my university career, I was invited to an event that was hosted by Elle magazine. They invited like maybe 20 of their readers to come and meet with the editor, talk about the content, give some suggestions on kind of some of the articles they liked, etc. I spoke about how important it was that magazines such as Elle magazine start talking about HIV and maybe if they could get someone to write an article about like someone living with HIV. I didn't even think it would be me. I just, you know, because I didn't see myself as that person. You were the girl who was HIV positive and speaking about it. Yeah, I started the writing process, which was kind of helped and led by the features director. 
It turned out to be this article on like the complexities of being positive and trying to explore your sexuality when you're living with HIV. And lots of people started writing in about it and it won an award. And from then on, I started getting calls and emails and people asked me to do work for them. As Pindi's profile rose, more requests and offers of work came flooding in. Then she set up a company called Rebranding HIV. These are some of my favorite projects and things that I've worked on. So this was the Pika Award. This was for the Elle magazine article. Picture of Kanye West in New York. And he came up to me and he was just like, yeah, I really liked your talk. And he was just a really, really nice person. So what was the event? Um, the event was for Alicia Key's organization called Keep a Child Alive. It's an annual fundraising black tie event. Mm -hmm. So she invites all of her celebrity friends and support organization. That particular year, they were talking about um, how HIV affects young people yeah. in South Africa. I saw her on TV in the morning news and they were talking about her organization rebranding HIV. And she was bubbly and talking about the background to this organization, her involvement, who she's worked with. I just felt that I have to know her in person. I have to get to know her. I have to work with her because she represented a young woman that would really be the face and speak on behalf of other young women that are living positively with HIV. We have 2,000 new infections of HIV every single week in South Africa. And these are young women. And it's the highest in the entire globe. If we really want to do anything that speaks to addressing HIV or eradicating HIV for that matter or ending AIDS, it has to have a face of a young person. Even in the social media, Pindi talks about her personal life. It's education for another young person that's living with HIV and has, this, has similar struggles but doesn't know how to address them. I remember I went onto a website and lots of websites actually and it was the same image um, of like a woman living in a derelict area um, who was who was really skinny and dying and and so it wasn't for me there was a disconnect between what I was experiencing and and what most of the websites were showing and so I was thinking about how my peers would would take that you know how I could speak to them about the same issues but kind of in a more youthful accessible voice and way. Sanibonani Ekaya. Our guest is Sara Chitambo, an advocacy manager for the prevention of HIV. Let's give her a warm rise welcome. Thank you, Sarah, for joining us today. It's so Thanks good to have me. you here. Thanks for having me in the studio. So, Sarah, we have two genital molds in front mm -hmm. of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, can you give us demonstrations on the do's and don'ts on correct condom use? Absolutely. So, in terms of correct condom use, let's start with the female condom. But, Sarah, I've, you know, I've often heard that you must put it in a few hours before. Is that true? No, absolutely not. It's not necessary anymore. And this can actually be quite a nice, uh, playful thing to do just before in terms of foreplay. <laughs> She trusts in herself, she trusts in her personality, she trusts in her knowledge, and she trusts in the information that she's sharing. So she, she walks in there like she actually is the guest of honor, you know, and she just takes charge. Number being shy, Kayabo, Mangim, and being shy, being shout in Jalunji. Yes, and but what that meant for me, Uguti, when I got into my relationships later on, mm. I can communicate, guys. Being Kala and being Lala, Mama being Kata and being Zuzangati, yes, I can't actually do this anymore. And that's why I was in an abusive relationship. Muntinje, and Tautis and Jalunji, and Jalis and Joseph different, and I couldn't actually get out of that relationship because I couldn't communicate properly. Yes, as a human being or anybody else that lives with HIV, she will have her daily struggles. But Pindi has never closed that door and she's never stopped journeying. And she's always, her life is so open. Since 
Since taking the leap to work as an HIV activist and opening her own HIV consulting business, Pendile Setole Spong has enjoyed rapid success and has impacted many lives. But making her life public has been challenging in many ways. All my boyfriends that I had during my university years knew about my status from the beginning. One of my relationships, it was going great until one day on my 22nd birthday, my ex-boyfriend bumped into a friend of his and I don't know what this friend said or what the conversation was, but at the end of it, he he kind of walked up to me and he and he started calling me names and he was like, actually, you're just a murdering bitch and you, you know, you deserve to die and how dare you try to bring me down with you. And he was my ride home because, you know, he had a car and um, so he left me on the side of, of Long Street um, and then he, yeah, he left and that was the end of that relationship. And what was the impact of that? Afterwards, I became a bit skeptical about dating because of some of the violent reactions that I had to my status. And eventually, actually, at some point, I, I even decided that I wouldn't date. It just wouldn't happen for me. I, I just put that idea behind me and was, became okay with the idea of just never being in a relationship. definitely does get down and she doesn't talk too much about it. She's not too open about it and I think it just comes from the fact that she constantly has to be strong and sometimes there's just too much pressure. She had a little biking accident and I live really close to her so she called me and I was really, really ill that day, um, coughing and just wasn't in great shape but I went with her to the hospital and got her sorted. And the next day she's like, Lilla, you know, I realize we're just really good friends. When I'm in trouble, you're the person I call. When I'm happy, you're the person I call. And for that reason, I can't think of it, um, making anyone else my maid of honor. And that, that hit home. Getting married is, I think, one of the best things to ever happen to her. Ed, her fiance, means the world to her, and she's extremely happy. In high school and in varsity, she definitely had a few boyfriends here and there, but it's the first time that I've seen her truly, truly happy and truly comfortable around someone, and someone who's her friend. First of all, do you want white or off-white? I don't know. <laughs> I think you should have white. You don't think off-white? Okay, what I do know is I don't want like, um, you know, I want a tight-fitted dress. Hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> this is, I think it just hit me that I'm getting married. <laughs> I'm gonna be a bit of real, suddenly it got real. But look at this. I want you to look at oh, that. That, that cool. is beautiful. And <gasps> like something. Oh, wow. That is very beautiful. My fiance and I met on Tinder. This was about three years ago. It ended up being probably one of the best first dates. We just had like an instant connection um, from our love of music to our love of food to, um, yeah, just the way we saw the world and, and our values. He had just arrived in South Africa from France. And yeah, ever since then, we've just kind of been joined at the hip. You can have a seat, I'll And here the shoes. Oh, this looks gorgeous, actually. <laughs> Sorry, I just almost took it out. Oh my goodness. <laughs> it is going to cry. Your body looks amazing in this. Yes, Pilates. <laughs> Don't cry. I'm not crying. I'm I'm pretty emotional. You're in a wedding dress, Pindi. <laughs> I don't think available. And I'm not growing my hair. He made me bold. He likes me bold. So that's how I'm gonna stay. It's bold. And drinking. 
<laughs> um, Maybe this one. Milky no, banana no, no, split. No, no, no banana. Apple. That's something we're struggling. Oh, this is strawberry. Ah, strawberry. Strawberry and cream. Perfect. I just realized something. I haven't been here since you proposed. It wasn't easy at first. I told him the first night about my status. Not knowing much about HIV, it was a process of him learning about HIV, what it was, the implications. He told his parents after I met them for the first time last year. And that was a decision we both made because I'm so public about my status. We both didn't want them to find out through like social media or like seeing an article and for them to be shocked. So we wanted it to be something personal that we did ourselves. This spot is perfect, especially when it's super hot in That's summer. His mom has been very well receiving of the news. Um, she's, of course, she was shocked at first. Um, I, I think because it's also not a big reality where he lives in France um, for someone to be living with HIV. It goes back to this, like, what HIV looks like from the outside if you don't have it. And the rest of his family is still struggling what to come to terms mean? with my status. Slowly but surely, they're starting to get there and we're starting to talk about it and, and kind of um, explaining to them that it's not a death sentence, that he's safe, that you know, things are okay. Um, it's been a slow and sometimes very difficult process, but I'd like to think that by the time we get married, things will be a little bit, you know, calm and, and everyone would have come to terms with, with my status and it won't be as difficult as it was. They'll come around, like I, I just have this belief that they will. After many years of sharing her life story, Pendile Sitole Spong has become a mentor to other young women. She works with a group called Girls Talk, which takes the focus off her personal life and allows her to be part of a community of women committed to educating their peers around sexual and reproductive health. We're having a girlstalk.mobi fundraising event and basically what we want to do is we want to get about 70 or 60 ladies to come and we'll have at lunch and we'll sell tickets for the event. And of course, from the girlstalk.mobi writers, we'd like two of you to speak on the day. We also need um, some replacements for some of the senior girls who will only be leaving next year, but it's good to start early so that when they go, it's not a big rush. You can't just write whatever you feel like. You can't make stuff up, guys. This is people's lives. You need to really do your research and find out why. And if someone doesn't know the answer to something, they'll ask the group, hey, guys, someone asked me this. Like, a provider just asked me now. She said a user asked her, what's kissing? Like, how do you start kissing? I don't even know how to answer that. I, my first kiss was so long ago. <laughs> <laughs> that I don't know what to advise. Like, how do you advise someone on, like, how do you prepare? I don't know, guys. Ladies, actually. Yeah, yeah. Say it one piece. Somebody, <laughs> yeah. Somebody yeah. 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 So you don't kiss on Is that the advice you're going to give you? Yeah. Not too long ago, I got a message from a young lady who's also HIV positive, and she, in the message, she said, I had to unfriend you because your life looks so good. Mm. You're engaged, you have a job, you, you're studying, everything seems perfect, but there's these other, like, really deep, dark things that are happening in my personal life that people might not be aware of unless I share them. Sure, I've come far, and there's been, like, really amazing moments. Behind that, there's also been a lot of pain and anguish. It, it sometimes hits me like an ocean, and I'm just, I feel like I'm drowning, and I just don't know what to do. It's just wanting to share so that other people can maybe learn from it or find the strength to ask for help, because I also know what it's like to not be able to ask for help. This is apple, pecan, nuts, and also made with gold flowers. Okay. I like these because they've got nuts in them, and I like the substance here. Okay, how about we have two of these? These would be nice for breakfast. 
I think we don't have a blueprint right now for how to like still live with HIV, you know? What does it feel like when you're 60 or 70 and you've been on ARVs for 50 years? You know, we don't have that. We just kind of still learning. Taking people through my growth and how I'm developing and like, oh, I'm 28 and I'm thinking of having children, but yeah, this happened, you know? Um, my, I have a tilted uterus. People really know way too much about my life. It is very different from any of It's so, so good. Thank you. Thank you so much. My approach now is much more on a lifestyle basis because I think it's really important part of not just being HIV positive, but just part of being alive um, and being a woman. There's so many issues that we deal with on a daily basis. So today I'm going to show you how to make one of my favorite smoothies. But you have to say hi, you know. Oh, do I have to do like a like 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 Pindela. <laughs> Pindela. <laughs> Hi, I'm Pindi and welcome to my first vlog. Today we'll be making a healthy protein smoothie. So this is great for meal replacement or just post-workout. It's really, really tasty. So one cup of almond milk, oops. And then of course I'm gonna use one banana. Okay, not so fast. If you become really big, just remember who filmed this. <laughs> Usually lunchtime is when I go for my smoothies because I don't have time to, to make like a big lunch and so this is like super easy to make and it helps my body to recover from the gym. I hope you like it. <laughs> How are we gonna end the vlog, baby? You we should cheers each other. Mm. People feel like, oh, good, but right? how can you be so confident doing stuff or going into a situation that's new or, or like starting a business, or like doing whatever it is that you're doing that's new or seen as new or could be difficult. It's just like, I've kind of done it my entire life, so I don't really know anything else. So it kind of, it feels normal and natural to me. Probably one of the greatest life lessons I think anyone can have is to not be comfortable. For a long time in my life, when I was younger, I didn't have the luxury of being comfortable. The things that I do, which people construe as like, confidence, it's really, I've had more practice with being uncomfortable.